All right. Uh, let me do a little uh, survey of our audience. Um, how do I sound? How's everyone doing today? Voice coming through okay? Not too, uh, not too grating, I hope. Uh, let's see. Um, I think we have all our panelists here. I think people are settling in, taking their seats. So, um, so while people are settling in, uh, I think I'll uh, go ahead and gavel us to order with uh, my opening remarks. Um, uh, let's see. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the inaugural panel discussion at the Science Circle for the fall 2019 semester. And thank you for attending. Uh, as a preliminary housekeeping matter, I want to remind everyone that the Science Circle is a grant funded nonprofit organization. Um, it's dedicated to advancing the use of virtual worlds in education. Uh, because it's a grant fund, it's grant funded, uh, we have to be pretty strict about conduct and attire. So I wanted to thank everyone for your understanding about that. Uh, today, or tonight, or this morning, whatever your case might be, uh, our topic is unanswered questions. The idea was to assemble speakers in different disciplines uh, and have them speak about open questions in their field. And we have with us today um, Nikolai Mnev, uh, Void, uh, William Wall, Syzygy, and Rob Knopp. Rob. Um, I'm very pleased to have uh, Nikolai uh, Void with us today to talk about his crazy maths, apparently. Uh, it's rare that we have the opportunity to discuss academic maths, so um, I'm particularly pleased to have Nikolai with us. Uh, uh, after Nikolai, um, William um, Stizigy will tell us about astronomy. And finally, Rob Knopp will sort of tie our topics together and tell us about questions concerning the Hubble constant. Um, and so without further ado, I will, uh, uh, I will ask uh, Nikolai uh, Void, I think, as his uh, 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 SL uh, tag, um, to tell us a little bit about what he studies and to go ahead and uh, open with uh, his presentation. Tell us what he wants to talk about. Uh, take it away, Nikolai. OK. Uh, so, uh, I'm Nikolai Mnev, I'm a mathematician from uh, St. Petersburg, Russia, but so, uh, mathematics is global, and so I, I'm actually uh, employed in many places, uh, in many places, in France, in Germany, uh, I spent a lot of time in United States, and so on. Uh, so, uh, today I will talk about uh, the strange and crazy thing because the answer on the uh, on the question on unsolved question in i think physics can be a is a standard boring discussion of uh various conjectures and so on riemann conjectures something more uh, uh stations of hypothesis useful like big data and so on or just uh crazy and so i prefer to be crazy and so uh, discuss the point which is uh, very uh, well known to all the uh, mathematicians at least uh, starting from some level that the main question uh, of mathematics is what is mathematics itself so it sounds uh, a little bit silly strange and uh, but it is not that silly it is a paradox and then mathematics itself is uh, 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 is itself is a paradox and so it works uh, it goes from paradox to paradox it is uh, something about paradox so this uh, uh, it is easy to just 
circulating online uh, uh, why it is so because all the science has some natural objects outside of the science to uh, investigate like so nature or languages or everything you like uh, and the object of mathematics is is the mathematics itself so but uh, let's come to details so uh, the standard uh, common opinion from the uh, uh, initial textbooks on mathematics that mathematics has objects so uh, they are numbers and figures it is a very good point and uh, it is actually so but uh, it is uh, extremely developed opinion uh, uh, which came from uh, 2000 years of Euclid elements as a measure textbook and Euclid elements is uh, uh, not elementary it is a compendium of uh, all known to Euclid uh, mathematics of uh, uh, this time and uh, it's really uh, uh, we learned mathematics but it is not simple mathematics we pretty developed and complicated point of view uh, but uh, from these two numbers and uh, figures, numbers are uh, by Goddard, and uh, figures are invented by people. Uh, uh, presenting those ideas about space. Uh, uh, numbers themselves are really felt like Goddard. But are, they are, as we know now, a subject of uh, the theory of paradox, so which uh, tells us that uh, uh, the numbers and its arithmetic is equivalent, logically equivalent to all the mathematics. That's the first point. The, but the second point that uh, we have no way to be sure that arithmetic doesn't contain contradictions. So uh, we have no way uh, to be sure that accurately and uh, consistently counting of our uh, income, for example, we generally uh, will never come to a paradox that is zero equal to one. So uh, some mathematicians uh, speculate that the main problem uh, of mathematics is to find a contradiction inside mathematics but we hope that uh, it is not so but 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 uh, according after good we uh, can only believe mathematics doesn't contain addiction in uh, its initial logical structure uh, which we are using and uh, so uh, mathematics is a uh, uh, equivalent to arithmetic it is objective but it is a kind of objective phase so uh, so it is initial paradox of all the science so i will uh, focus uh, on uh, two uh, stories uh, to illustrate the uh, strange situation with mathematics which is uh, uh, which is uh, actually how strange it is it isn't in common knowledge it is in, in uh, common knowledge from mathematicians but not uh, other people so uh, the first story is the uh, story of uh, zero and positional number system so uh, how accidents in the mathematics defines civilization and so extremely dramatic so uh, the, the, uh, that will be my uh, first story uh, the positional numbers as we now know uh, from 19th century in 19th century in middle of 19th uh, uh, century Babylonian civilization was discovered before it, it was a Bible language. So now we know that Babylonian used base 60 positional number 6 uh, system, uh, but without zero. And uh, they was very good in 
at computation and now we know that they have a geometry astronomy uh, they develop algorithm and uh, for example one of Babylonia algorithm are working now and uh, responsible now for computer tomography it's a, a, a Babylonian algorithm which was analyzed in 80s uh, no in 70s and so uh, error correction alga Babylonian algorithm in financial uh, in financial tables uh, so then uh, Greeks Greeks uh, who are uh, uh, founders of uh, founders of uh, our science as we understand it uh, who developed mathematics a lot in form of geometry uh, had no positional number system so they was not able to uh, calculate fast and about zero they uh, they uh, Greeks uh, were extremely philosophical about zero they discussed this subject but speculated that nothing can have a name uh, uh, actually they uh, had uh, two kinds of numbers one of uh, one are rational numbers which are for merchants actually and geometrical numbers uh, represented by intervals geometrical and they discuss the relation between them and this relation is extremely important and actually uh, uh, it is important uh, the understanding of this relation on some deep level uh, continues up, up to now uh, so but mm, uh, the positional number system was almost invented by Archimedes so he stopped actually in one line before the discovery of positional number system so he uh, was interested in multiplying all big numbers and so in, uh, in, in invented a, a, a way to do it and so it contained everything for positional number system and uh, there is an opinion of great mathematician Carl the Gauss, the greatest calamity in history, in history of science, was the failure of Archimedes to invent positional notation. To what heights uh, would science now be uh, raised if uh, Archimedes had uh, made this discovery? Wrote Gauss in mid of 19th century. He, he calculated that 19th age of science could happen at the beginning of of the uh, common air if uh, Archimedes didn't stop one line before uh, discovery of positional number system. Uh, the modern system, modern pen uh, based system, uh, how we know it, was created in India in 6th century. Uh, uh, together with mathematical zero as we know it and negative number uh, mm, and uh, it boosted uh, science and engineering astronomy and so on in India but uh, mm, India was uh, suffered from Muslim uh, invasion uh, uh, which destroyed huge ecosystem of Indian uh, education at, uh, and universities but still uh, mathematics survived on the very south of India in so-called Malabar Kerala or by just by the uh, name of Temple Village Miller School of Mathematics and so uh, at those hard times uh, so uh, they develop uh, analysis, integration, astronomy, uh, astronomy the summation of uh, infinite trigonometric areas in uh, 15th, 16th century, just uh, about 200 years 
before Leibniz and Ip Newton. Uh, so uh, it became actually known only recently because uh, mm, uh, this light uh, survived, uh, just didn't uh, survive the European colonial invasion, colonial wars, and so uh, those writings was on uh, Tamil and Malayalam language, uh, but written on uh, palm leaves. Uh, well, uh, here I have a, a picture of palm leaf uh, book typical for uh, South India. And so the libraries, this collection of those handful scripts was lost in fire in Cochin and Lisbon, unfortunately. But uh, uh, the main uh, known uh, Indian mathematician and now the uh, Ramanujan, the uh, mathematically at least uh, he is uh, relative he come from this school uh, while it is obvious mathematically he did uh, execute this mathematics in that way uh, but uh, it is not stated explicitly anywhere but, but uh, mathematically he uh, is on the top of this school so uh, from uh, India um, uh, this come to Arabs, uh, uh, the persecutional number system was learned by uh, Arabs, and so uh, there was one more occasion. It was uh, brought to Europe occasionally, almost occasionally, because in, uh, uh, at the end of the 12th century, one uh, merchant. Uh, from Pisa uh, figured out that Arabs can count extremely fast and he, he uh, sent his uh, son uh, Leonardo to Arab school it was somewhere in uh, Algeria and uh, Leonardo who uh, is now known as Ibanacci uh, learned uh, Arabic language and uh, this uh, art of counting translated the book of al Khwarezmi on the Hindu art of reckoning to uh, Latin language and then uh, wrote his own book and so since that uh, the art of fast counting spread it uh, in Europe and actually from the uh, side of exact sciences, uh, they boosted the development of mathematics, astronomy, and so on, and so on, and so on. Finally, uh, it once more time came to analysis, and so uh, to uh, our days. But it was occasion, uh, because it could happen <coughs> 100 years uh, later or earlier. But it uh, changes uh, all our history. So the, the next story is uh, about numbers and figures. Uh, mm, numbers are uh, uh, got done, figures are invented. Uh, as our view uh, expressed, and the simplest relation between numbers and figures is the dimension. So Aristotle proved by uh, well known to uh, us uh, X Y Z argument that uh, our space is a three-dimensional. But it was uh, 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 up to uh, 1845, the space could have dimension only one, two, and three. And this uh, year, Grassmann, German teacher of classical gymnasium, published a paper uh, where he presented uh, more dimension space and uh, tools to describe it geometry. It was not acknowledged. Uh, uh, 
before his death, but after his death, people immediately understood that it is a, a extremely good thing to input uh, geometry on the spaces of allusions, so the structure of pieces on, on the allusions of uh, equations, of uh, algebraic differential equations in physics, and so on, and, and so on. <laughs> so, uh, uh, it is... Uh, uh, so algebra and physics obtain a geometry as a result. But uh, in uh, 1877, uh, uh, George Cantor crushed Aristotle's argument. So he established one-to-one -one correspondence between the point of intervals and point of square uh, uh, and points of Q and just uh, points of Aristotle's three dimensional space. So, Aristotle's argument well, doesn't work. Uh, 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 so, uh, the mention appears to be something similar. It's instance after his discovery. He wrote his friend Dedekind, I see it, but I don't believe it. Uh, so, uh, the uh, absolute physical space uh, from Aristotle lost dimension. Uh, it was mm, big trouble and uh, sorry, uh, sorry, wrong slide. It was uh, big trouble, uh, so many people, uh, great people was trying to fight with it, with this situation, so the dimension uh, and physical space appears to be paradoxical. Uh, so the point was uh, that um, uh, Cantor, uh, Cantor's map and uh, the maps based of, uh, on his arguments, so developed by Piano and they are somehow non-continuous, but uh, at that time there was no explicit notion what means to be con continuous, so everybody uh, felt that uh, something is continuous, something is not continuous, but uh, there was no uh, founding of continuity, mm -hmm. uh, and as a result, the, uh, of resolving of this paradox, the continuity was annotated and it led to the uh, development of topology mostly by uh, Poincaré. Uh, uh, so, and finally, uh, the problem was solved uh, in this line. Uh, by uh, 29 years old, Dutch mathematician Lutzen uh, Egbertus Jan Brouwer in 1910. So, uh, using fresh tools of algebraic topology and homological algebra, he uh, proved the invariance of continuous dimension. And uh, as a result, we uh, got uh, a good known function, what means to be continuous space, which is actually uh, now time space of physics, so example, in general relativity, and so on, and so on, and so on. But uh, 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 this notion of space, it is deep and good mathematical model where uh, our uh, physics uh, somehow works, but it isn't absolute something because, for example, to be uh, good, to have a dimension, the uh, space should uh, consist uh, of something what uh, we never saw from points, and moreover, any on any scale, any two points could be uh, should be uh, which could be able to separate one from another uh, by small neighbors. Uh, 
so uh, physically uh, it works okay so on large scale but you know quantum physics and quantum mechanics uh, uh, things supposed to be quantum science uh, and so uh, this uh, uh, not uh, absolute thing now and so there is a problem what to do with it in physics for example it, uh, it is in practical aspects of the current communications so you see that uh, mathematics is paradoxical and so uh, on this uh, obvious examples historical examples uh, uh, to see how it tries to understand itself and so, uh, actually, all the big problems in mathematics, which are hard to explain to the general uh, audience, because it is an uh, interior problems, they are interior problems about inner structure of mathematics and how some symmetries in mathematics, symmetries between the uh, geometry and numbers and so on and so on and so on, and actually all the known problems, actually, uh, as a Poincaré problem and as a um, as a Riemannian conjecture and so on, uh, they are problems on this of this kind. So uh, I think my time is over now. So okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Nikolai. That was uh, that was really fun. Um, and uh, I have to say, your slides are quite enjoyable. I like them. Um, uh, I'm sorry for my English and mistakes uh, in some slides, but my English is good now. Yeah, yeah. OK. Uh, I think you did just fine. Thank you very much. We really appreciate uh, your, um, you know, uh, your work to uh, prepare that presentation and to share it with us. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, so uh, I'm writing not on uh, palm leaves, but on iPad, which is much more easy. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, um, let, oh, is that better? Uh, I just moved my microphone, so hopefully I'm sounding a little bit better now. Um, uh, I don't really see too many questions in the local chat, so let's uh, move right along since we still have two more speakers. Um, our next speaker is Syzygy, uh, William Wall, and he's going to update us on um, astronomy, basically. Um, Nikolai, if you would go ahead and, I guess, just remove your slide screen. Just I take that back in inventory. I was wondering if I could Jim, maybe ask a question of Nikolai. Oh, yeah, sure, please, go ahead, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see, just looking at all here. Okay. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I was struck by the um, way you can apparently map a single dimension, a line, into, say, two spaces, like a, a cube, or map it into a three space. Yeah, there are, uh, as I understand it, different kinds of infinities, like one kind of infinity is, is the number of uh, rational numbers, and another kind of infinity of irrational numbers. It seems to me that that's sort of similar to the type of mapping you're talking about, or, or maybe I'm completely wrong. I'm just wondering if you could comment on that. Sure, sure. Uh, Cutter proved that uh, that uh, Cutter proved that uh, uh, point on the interval, on the, so on the geometric interval is continuous. And so uh, it is the uh, same continuous number as a uh, of, uh, in space by establishing just one-to-one -one correspondence. So then uh, it was a pretty complicated logical argument, and so uh, uh, this made more clear by Piano, uh, more geometrical by Piano and uh, Hilbert, this map, but it is still complicated. It, 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 this map is uh, approximated by the continuous map, but finally the map is uh, discontinuous in all the points. But it is right, yes, the, uh, they have the same number of, of points. Okay. 
Thank, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I enjoyed your slides too. Um, so uh, thanks uh, for um, thanks for coming here, everybody, and uh, hello to everyone. I'm uh, <clears throat> I thank the organizers for inviting me. That's Chantal, Jess, and uh, I guess that's Matthew too. Um, so I was asked to come up with a um, research question to attack in, in detail, and uh, uh, like Nikolai, I figured I would do something a little more general because it's a good question. What is astronomy? Um, <clears throat> and one way to look at that question is to come up with the or provide a list of the research questions, the many research questions there are in astronomy. Um, <clears throat> I'm doing basically the whole universe. Um, here's a picture of the universe. This is a nearby cluster of, not that nearby, L370, and it's lensing a distant uh, cl cluster of galaxies. It's a cluster of galaxies lending, lensing a distant cl cluster of galaxies, and you can see the strange shapes of these galaxies in the background that are being lensed. One point I'm making here is that astronomical sources are great laboratories for testing our ideas. So I'm basically going to be doing the entire universe in 20 minutes, which yes, it's overly ambitious, maybe even insane. It could be useful in some way, you tell me, even though I won't be answering any of the questions um, that I'll be putting forward. The idea is to provide a, uh, a glimpse of the sweeping vis of astronomical research which I think will be interesting in itself, and we can always discuss these questions later on, if maybe at some future date. Okay, here it is. So any field of scientific inquiry is vast, and compiling a list of key questions, determining which questions are key, uh, is very difficult and requires requires hindsight, really. Um, you can only tell after the fact which ones truly were important. And I would say that's even more so than astronomy, for astronomy than for other fields because it literally uh, studies the entire universe. So astronomy is, is, is involves uh, physics, chemistry, geology, and biology. These are vast fields in themselves, but astronomy overlaps and even pushes back the frontiers in those fields. Astronomy involves every subfield of physics, and I've listed a number of them here, classical physics, relativity, atomic physics, nuclear physics, thermodynamics, electromagnetism, condensed matter physics, and so on. <clears throat> um, so in addition to these subfields of physics, there are real subfields of astrochemistry, astrogeology, and astrobiology, which have their own journals. Um, Astrobiology, too, which I found a little bit surprising because there are no living specimens from outside the Earth. And there's there are actual books on astro astrobiology now. Uh, there's an astro astrobiology journal, astrogeology journal. Um, this is a U.S. Geological Survey geological map of Mars. <coughs> and here's the Hubble Ultraviolet Field, which answers questions about, helps us answer questions about cosmology as well as galaxy evolution. <coughs> so what I'm saying here is uh, it is a daunting task to be certain, but it'll help us better understand the field if we attempt to find the key questions and the boundaries of the field. What is the field and what is not the field? What separates those two, if it's such a separation? Fine. Which can help set priorities for future research. And inspire future research. It promotes thinking outside the box, which is a bad idea for a cat, but it's a great idea for scientists. It is a great learning experience to do this. So a good place to start, of course, is the internet. And Wikipedia has this article on the list of unsolved problems in astronomy. This uh, article has um, well, is, is far from complete. And uh, there's a lot of stuff missing, but I'll try to fill in at least some of it. There's no way I'm going to fill, fill in all of it in 20 minutes. Um, planetary astronomy questions are uh, questions of uh, planets beyond Neptune. Are there planets beyond Neptune? There are dwarf planets beyond Neptune, and their elongated orbits seem to have some kind of correlation, which is good. Uh, there are questions about 
Saturn's rotation and magnetosphere, and, and these, these questions, uh, questions like them, apply to Jupiter. Well, then there's stellar astronomy. Good place to start, of course, is the Sun. It has a magnetic field uh, which affects its uh, sunspots and seems to be a, a diagnostic of its overall activity. And when there's a sunspot minimum called the Maunder minimum, um, the, Earth, the sun was unusually cold and so was the Earth. So why did this Maunder minimum occur? Where did the sun recover from the Maunder minimum? Then there's the sun's corona. I realize I'm going quickly through here, I'm not addressing every question, but we can always come back to this later if there are questions. It's so much hotter than the sun's surface. And why is that? Well, the answer might be in the next section, um, uh, the next question. Magnetic reconnection of the sun's uh, magnetic field. You can think of them as rubber bands threading the sun. There's a lot of energy in these rubber bands. And when they're stretched, in the sun and by the rotation of the sun, they will break and they'll reform new rubber bands that fly off into the solar system and these rubber bands are carrying charged particles with them. So you get solar flares and coronal mass ejections. But they seem to be happening faster. These reconnection events are fasting half faster than predicted by standard models. Why is it happening so fast? This uh, one problem with this Wikipedia article is they have almost no questions about star formation, and that is a very important question in astronomy, um, uh, the details of star formation. One question they have here, and I'll come back to star formation a little bit later, is about the stellar initial mass uh, function. This is when the stars form, they have a distribution of masses. What determines that? What is the exact me mechanism by which you have a core collapse supernova, and that's represented by this diagram here. How does that exactly work? I don't know why this is in the stellar astronomy section, but um, maybe because stars are the reasons for uh, fast radio bursts. These are transient radio pulses that are very strong, and they seem to come from very tiny regions compared to the size of an, even a planet. And they have been uh, detected in the galaxy. There's a gigaparsec away. And the first repetition, these uh, uh, fast radio bursts apparently do repeat. And the first repetition was was uh, detected by this telescope here, a series of troughs. It's an impressive telescope. It's 80 meters by 100 meters, and it's made on a shoestring budget because it has no mechanical moving parts. A very large radio telescope called CHIME, Canadian H1 mapping experiment in the interior of British Columbia, Canada. Um, <clears throat> I've been to see this telescope because I used to be a graduate student at the observatory. It is impressive. And it was the first to detect this repetition of a fast radio burst, which may help us understand fast radio bursts better. Then there are questions about cosmic rays. Um, they interact with the cosmic background radiation, so they shouldn't be able to travel very far, um, ex with some exceptions which aren't understood. And then there's Tabby's star, which some have heard about. Supposedly, um, aliens built structures around it that caused uh, fluctuations in its brightness because it was one star. 2018, there's a paper, paper pu published, found um, that it was actually, the fluctuations are now quite as strong, suggesting it's probably just dust. So um, I like the caption here, which you can't really read. It says, it's not aliens, it's never aliens. And next, uh, another incomplete list about uh, galactic astronomy. You see here, let's see, this is a galaxy, and as we go, out in distance along this graph here, you see this, and there's velocity this way, we can look at the rotation of this galaxy, and the rotation follows this curve. Beyond a certain distance, it should be falling off, but it's not falling off. Why shouldn't it be, why isn't it falling off? You'd expect it to be going down like this. One reason is um, probably something called dark matter that's responsible for it, although there are other, exp another explanation, modified Newtonian gravity, which actually very well on its um, <clears throat> just called MOND for short. Now stars, as they age, they become more metallic, which means they develop, um, they produce more elements that are heavier than helium. Um, so you would expect an age metallicity relationship in our galaxy. Um, there seems to be a, a somewhat universal relationship, depending on where you look. It's not completely 
universal? I don't know. They didn't ask any questions about spiral density waves in this article. That would be would be interesting because we have, of course, galaxies galaxies like this one, M51, with its spiral arms, spiral arm uh, pattern. Spiral arm pattern um, is how stable is it? How long will it live? Maybe its galaxies shift from one spiral pattern to another, and then are, there are other spiral. There are other instabilities in the plane, such as bars, which are not totally understood either, and how they affect star formation. And then here's a, a, a picture you've seen before. Rob, Rob has given us a talk on the first image of a black hole by the Event Horizon Telescope. One of our telescopes in Mexico was involved with that. But a large millimeter wave telescope, Alfa Alfonso Serrano. The great thing about black holes is they uh, help us understand uh, rel general relativity and also the um, interface between general relativity and quantum mechanics, which is why uh, Stephen Hawking was so interested in black holes. So many questions about internal structure, if such exists. They produce thermal radiation. Do they produce the Hawking radiation at the level you'd expect? Then they would evaporate. What happens to the information inside them? Because quantum mechanics doesn't allow for loss of information. <clears throat> And then there's a question about how supermassive black holes form. They had to have very massive black holes merging. And we know that black holes merge because of the LIGO experiment, gravitational radiation from the mergers. Um, but if they're particularly massive black holes, they don't accelerate enough to radiate away their gravitational radiation. So it would take longer than the age of the universe for them to merge. So there must be some mechanism by which they're able to do so, because such supermassive black holes exist in the centers of galaxies, including the one in this picture here. Then there are questions on cosmology, and Rob's going to handle one of those, having to do with the distribution of dark matter and dark energy in the universe. You can see this diagram here. Most of the energy density in the universe is dark energy with some dark matter, and just a tiny amount of the kind of matter that we know uh, about, that we can detect, called uh, baryonic matter. And this diagram represents the expansion of the universe. There's this early inflation. This is time going up. And this represents the size of the universe from side to side. Acceleration here is here. So there are basic questions like, what is dark matter? It's some kind of particle, or maybe there is instead of some extension to gravity, like MON. Then there's questions about the Hubble constant, which Rob will handle, and further questions about the acceleration. What causes the acceleration? Presumably dark energy, or maybe it's something else. And the fate of the universe. What is the fate of the universe? The latest energy and the latest um, evidence suggests that we will be undergoing a big rip where everything is torn apart as the universe accelerates faster and faster. Although I don't think this is completely ruled out where the universe undergoes a big crunch. And then who knows, maybe another big bang and it starts again. Could be a cycle for the universe. And as I said before, star formation is a very interesting question. It's a very, uh, the very stars that we see at night, how did they form? There are many details that we don't understand. Stars form from the interstellar medium and specifically from molecular clouds. The interstellar medium is uh, ionized gas, atomic gas, and molecular gas, and, all, and it's almost entirely hydrogen. I'm talking about clouds of molecular, clouds of molecular hydrogen. Here's a molecular cloud, a giant molecular cloud. The stars form a giant molecular cloud. We see some stars here. The reason we can see them, this is an image in the infrared. Look through much of the dust. So there are many questions about how the initial conditions, the physical conditions in these molecular clouds, how do they determine the final stellar properties? Do we have an isolated star forming? Not usually. You usually get stellar clusters. And that produces a certain initial mass function. Why that particular initial mass function? Environment. And stars tend to destroy the uh, molecular clouds in which they form. Then there are questions about the stability of giant molecular clouds. Now I have a diagram here, and I'm going to show up a blow-up of this diagram. This is a this is a beautiful diagram. This is the plane of our galaxy. 
and it's seen in a tracer of molecular hydrogen and a carbon monoxide location line. We'll talk about that shortly. But papers in the 1970s by Zuckerman et al. have strongly asserted that these clouds have to be turbulently supported because if they're not, if they're undergoing large scale collapse, we would see a star formation rate much higher than we do see. And we'd also see a spectral signature of collapse. Now, there's been recent work by uh, Enrique Vasquez and company at, at Morelia and UNAM, which is the Autonomous National University in Mexico. They um, run numerical simulations of the of the evolution of molecular clouds, and they and they say that there's there's enough evidence from observational evidence as well as from their simulations to suggest that. On a large scale, giant molecular clouds in our galaxy are undergoing large scale collapse. Why don't you have an unusually high star formation rate? Because the stars, as said here, disrupt the, the clouds that they form in. So that stops the star formation from continuing. Also, you don't expect to see a very simple spectral signature of collapse because you have collapse occurring at different, uh, different scales, different hierarchies within the, within the clouds. So let's let's look at this a bit better. So here's here's our galaxy. This is the plane of our galaxy from longitude 10 degrees to 50 degrees. The center of our galaxy would be way over. This is a, a an image of our galactic plane as well, but this is in infrared, so you see hot dust and some stars. And you see some blow-ups of these regions here, showing you the, the structure structure. This map is, is beautiful, done with a Nobiyama no 45 meter. In, and you can see all kinds of filamentary structure and clumps. These, these, these maps are beautiful and fascinating. Down here, in this particular uh, GMC, the uh, giant molecular cloud, uh, M17 Southwest, <coughs> you can see filamentary structure on a smaller scale. Now Enrique and I want to observe with the LMT a GMC like this one to see if the filaments behave in the same way as his models. And we might be able to do that with the LMT next year. I'm hoping that we can do that because see how well his models work. <laughs> and of course, another thing that's left out, exoplanets and extraterrestrial life. That's an absolutely fascinating area. I find it fascinating. I think almost everyone finds this fascinating. Questions about exoplanets. How do they form? Um, how do the rotations interact with their orbits? Questions for our own solar system as well. How common are exomoons? They must be very common, but they might be very difficult to detect. And I love this poster. Potentially habitable exoplanets. These exoplanets are real. The images are not real. These are just artists' conceptions because we don't have actual images of them, but I still like the poster. <clears throat> Then, of course, you get to extraterrestrial life. If you have exoplanets, you might have extraterrestrial life. But can we find unambiguous biosignatures in the spectra of these exoplanet atmospheres? The key word there is unambiguous. Is it possible to find unambiguous signatures? Well, here's an example of a planet um, spectrum. This is actually just the Earth, what it would look like if it were an exoplanet. I don't think the signal to noise would be so high, but um, you can see certain lines like oxygen, water vapor lines. And uh, how do they do that? Well, I come over to this diagram. You see if the Earth is in the plane of the uh, exoplanet's orbit, you'll see the planet passing in front of the star. This is called a transit or a primary eclipse. And when that happens, you see the light here will dip down as it passes in front. But if it has an atmosphere, it'll dip down lower. And if it dips down lower, the amount it dips down, that extra dipping, varies with wavelength. And that variation in that dipping is what you would get in this spectrum here. And if you get oxygen, supposedly it's a great biosignature, but I read in, uh, believe it or not, I, I checked an, ext an astrobiology journal from 2018 saying that this oxygen could actually be produced by photodissociation or photolysis of other molecules like H2O or, or CO2 if the star has particularly strong ultraviolet emission. So these 
oxygen is not necessarily an unambiguous biosignature, fortunately. Anyway, what kinds of stars are likely to have life-bearing exoplanets? Different spectral types means basically different temperatures. And there are questions about questions. Okay, so if you're feeling confused and overwhelmed, then you're normal. This is the whole universe in about 20 minutes. This was an incomplete, somewhat disorganized survey, but I'm hoping it conveys a sense of the breadth of astronomy and that the many active subfields of research will push back the boundaries not only of astronomy but other fields, maybe even biology. And there are the references. I've made a PDF version of this talk available to Chantal, so you can get that from her if you're interested. My apologies for going so fast. I wanted to have time for discussion at the end, um, so feel free to ask me questions. Or All right, applause, applause. Wow. That was uh, that was that really was enjoyable. enjoyable. Uh, Thank um, you. Uh, let me see. Uh, I let's see. I'm scrolling back up through our um, comments. I uh, since if we, uh, since you did leave us a little bit of time, I wanted to touch base on a couple of things. Uh, you one of your slides mentioned the Big Rip. Uh, I'm not really familiar with that. Can you expand upon that a little bit? Um, and then I have one other uh, question too. Sure. Let me see if I can get back there. Let's see. Yeah, okay, so big rip. The idea is that as the universe expands and the acceleration, the acceleration would supposedly become so intense that the molecules and atoms themselves would be torn apart. Oh, I see. So um, uh, that's sort of a prospect that the uh, acceleration of the expansion just, just keeps accelerating until everything just gets ripped apart, sort of? Is that fair to say? Yep. Something like that? Yep. Yeah. I don't understand all the mechanisms huh. of it. I don't know. Right. Why it, would, it would have to be like an uh, acceleration down to very small scales as well, that, so that it would affect the. the yes. Fascinating. The and then uh, one other, th uh, one other thing I wanted to uh, mention is the uh, LIGO telescope that detected the uh, gravitational waves. Um, I think that's right. Is it LIGO? So. Um, uh, I, I heard something recently that made me a little bit curious. I was sort of under the impression that the detection of the gravitational waves was kind of a one-off experiment where we set it up and we detected the gravitational waves and then that was the end of it. But, um, but I heard something recently that there are sort of ongoing observations of gravitational waves. So now that we have the LIGO telescope set up, is it, is it kind of a a working operational telescope that kind of, kind of allows us to monitor gravitational waves, or what's going on with that? Yeah, that's it's a full-time observatory, and it's it's not exactly done with. They, they have had a number of detections. I don't know the rate. Maybe Rob knows the rate, but it's something like a couple of, of per month of some kind of gravitational collapse. I think they've even had um, um, a merger of black hole with a neutron star. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's ongoing. It's an ongoing observatory, and it's not the only one. There are two of them, one in Louisiana, one in Washington, and so they both they both detect things. Oh, a neutron star and a neutron star merger, too. too. Fascinating. Uh, so I just love that. That's great. I'm, it's gratifying to know that, uh, you know, it's still um, generating a lot of good science. Yes, it's important because, I mean, we're not using the electromagnetic spectrum. We're not even using, you know, the usual particles. You're not even trying to have a neutrino observatory, which would be interesting in itself. But uh, it's not using particles, so not conventional particles anyway. It's, it's, it's fluctuations in space-time. Yeah, it's trippy. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thanks very much. I, I think we should move along. I. Uh, um, that we have a lot of interesting comments uh, in uh, local chat, um, and which, uh, I would, which I would love to get to sometime. I mean, if we had time at the end, maybe we can get through some. Of, you you had some interesting yeah. comments too about turbulence and so on, right? So. Oh yes, I did. But I, I, actually, I think you sort of addressed those as you continued talking. But, um, uh, well, okay. Anyway, so I'm kind of scrolling back through the chat here. So. 
uh, I guess we should move on and maybe we can come back to these if we have time at the end. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, but I do want to get to uh, Rob's presentation on the Hubble constant, which I assume is going to combine maths with astronomy, sort of tying our topics together. So uh, Rob, why don't you uh, um, pick up from here? All right, so I guess I'm sort of a conformist because uh, Chantal asked us to talk about a big outstanding question, and so I'm talking about just one question. So I won't be giving you a huge history, but I still will give you a history of this question, the question of the Hubble constant. Um, this is the Hubble constant, the tension in the Hubble constant is what I'm identifying as the biggest question in cosmology specifically. And as you just heard from Mike's talk, astronomy is way more than just cosmology. So I would hesitate for the same reason Mike did to say what is the biggest question in astronomy because, you know, find six astronomers and you'll get eight answers to the question. So um, even in cosmology, people would disagree about what the biggest question is. And then you'll have to see, what do you mean by biggest? Is it the, the biggest as in the most cosmic, the most fundamental? Is it the biggest as in the thing people worry about the most? I don't know. But in any event, this question is a big one because it's sort of an outstanding sore point in cosmology right now. It's a place where stuff on our data doesn't seem to line up quite right. And we don't know what's going on. So the Hubble constant, what is the Hubble constant? The Hubble constant is the current expansion rate of the universe. It's a parameter in our cosmology, and it's a number, that, it's a way of saying what is the current expansion rate of the universe. And one way of talking about it is that if you compare the distance of a galaxy um, to the speed it's moving away from us, well, if things farther away are moving faster, that's an expansion. That's what an explosion would be like, although that's not really what the expansion of the universe is. Um, and we observe, and this is from a paper from 2001, which is one of the classic papers on the Hubble constant, that galaxies at greater distances are uh, moving away from us faster, and it's a line. The relationship is a line, and the Hubble constant is just the proportionality, of, or the constant of proportionality between the two. So the value of 72 kilometers per second per megaparsec says, and I'm going to say this not one megaparsec, but a galaxy that is 10 megaparsecs away, well, I would multiply it by this constant, and I would get 720 kilometers per second. So that'll show up right about here on the plot. So something that's 10 megaparsecs away will be moving at 720 kilometers per second away from us. Now, that's just due to the expansion of the universe. Galaxies also thrash around um, each other as they're in clusters and they orbit and things like that as well, and that's motion on top of this expansion. But as a whole, galaxies are all moving away from us. They're all getting farther away from us, and the Hubble constant tells us the expansion rate. Now, it's the Hubble constant means today's expansion rate because of the dynamics of dark energy and dark matter and all of that stuff. Um, the expansion rate has changed over the history of the universe. So when you say the Hubble parameter, you're referring to whatever, at what, however long since the Big Bang you want to talk about. But the Hubble constant means today's expansion rate. So, and there's various ways to measure today's expansion rate of the universe. Um, and you get plots like this one when you do that. Well, so the Hubble constant is so called the Hubble constant because Edwin Hubble is the first one who gave us a value for it. Back in 1929, he published a paper where he had looked at, and notice he called them extragalactic nebulae because this was around the same time, you know, within 10 years of us figuring out that galaxies were other galaxies and not nebulae in our own galaxy. And so the name extragalactic nebula is sort of vestigial from that. He measured Doppler shifts and got speeds, and he measured distances from brightnesses of a kind of variable star and made this plot and saw this relationship. And notice he got a Hubble constant of 500. That's a whole lot bigger than the one that we have today. And the reason for that is that he was looking at one kind of variable star and thought he was looking at a different kind of variable star. And so all of the galaxies were actually much farther away than his estimates based on the fact that he was looking at a different type of star from the one he thought he was looking at. Um, well, all right, so that's 1929, and today we have a different value. The Hubble constant sort of has a long and sorted history. So you start back around 1929, thereabout, you have these early measurements that are around 100. You actually have George Lemaitre um, published a, a very early one, even before Hubble, with the idea of the expanding universe. And you can see that the uh, estimates of the Hubble constant sort of came down as people measured it towards what is probably much closer to the real value. Um, 
and there's sort of interesting things in here you could talk about with the sociology of science as well as just the science itself. But somewhere around 1970, we settled on the idea that the Hubble constant in these units had a value somewhere between 50 and 100. And then for about two or three decades, it stayed that way. And it was sort of interesting that there were two main folks working on measuring the Hubble constant. One was Sandage and Taman, and the other was de Vaucouleurs and de Vaucouleurs. So Sandage always came up with values around 50, and de Vaucouleurs always came up with values around 100, and both of them published error bars that were much smaller than the distance between them. And astronomers who were not in either camp sort of threw our hands up and said, well, we'll call it 75 plus or minus 25 because we don't know who's right. Now, I would say probably a lot of astronomers sort of believed in their heart that Sandage was right. Turns out that neither one of them was right. Um, they were bracketing what is probably the real value. But there was this long period of time. And so including when I was in grad school, so I went, in, I went to grad school in 1990. That's actually off the edge of this plot. But even still, in the early 1990s, in fact, through basically all of the 1990s, the Hubble constant was still uncertain between 50 and 100. We didn't know it to a factor of two. So there was a gigantic um, uncertainty in what the actual expansion rate of our universe was, which is the most fundamental parameter in all of cosmology, or at least the most basic parameter, if not the most fundamental parameter. So, uh, you know, I was working on stuff that wasn't cosmology back in grad school, and so I just sort of said, okay, it's 75 plus or minus 25. We don't really know what it is. And in fact, it's a little bit like there was this other thing that happened when I was in grad school, the Soviet Union went away. Well, I remember in the 80s, being in high school, the Soviet Union would be forever, right? I, I never expected the Soviet Union to go in my, away in my lifetime, never mind when I was so young. I also expected in grad school that we would not know the value of the Hubble constant for a long time. I figured out oh, it's going to be uncertain for a real long time. Well, so, th so this is the thing I want you to remember, is that for a very long time, we had settled on about what the Hubble constant was, close to the modern value, but it was uncertain to a factor of two. So it just, we just knew that we didn't know it very well. Well, all right. The way of, of measuring the Hubble constant that all these folks did it was by looking at stuff where you knew how bright it was, so some kind of variable star or a supernova or something like that, and measuring its redshift to see how fast it's moving, look at how bright it is to figure out how far away it is. There is a whole completely independent different way you could measure the Hubble constant that depends on looking at the cosmic microwave background. So um, this is you. And as you look further out into the universe, um, one important thing to realize is that you're also looking back in time. It takes time for light to travel. So if you're looking at something that is 500 light years away, that would be a star in our own galaxy, it took 500 years for the light to reach you. So if you're looking at something that's billions of light years away, you are looking at it as it was billions of years ago. We can look back far enough that we are looking so far back in time, about 13.7 billion years in time, that the universe was all plasma. It was all hot and it was all dense and it was one big soup of plasma, dark matter, mixed in with protons and electrons and some other stuff, bouncing around with um, photons, so light all bouncing around. And it was opaque and bouncing around. And, and as the universe expanded and went through a transition from opaque to transparent. So if you imagine looking uh, through sorry, very thin light towards the surface of a light bulb or the surface of the sun or something like that, you can kind of see, see, see until you get to the opaque surface and then you can't see beyond that. And that's what we see. We call it the cosmic microwave background when we look just the right distance away, that we're looking just the right amount of time and past. We see the universe when it was opaque. And we see this uniform glow everywhere across the sky. And this was a big deal back in the 60s when this was discovered because this was a prediction of the Big Bang model. And then we discovered it and said, hey, this is really what made people think that the Big Bang model was a good model to describe our universe. Uh, measurement since then, here's a measurement from 1990 of the spectrum of it. What's important about this is um, the, the squares are the data points and the error bars on the squares are smaller than the squares. The line is a theoretical fit to a pure thermal spectrum, something that's glowing just because it's hot. The universe, when you look at it as a whole, looking back when it was all plasma, is an extremely perfect black body. 
What's more, the temperature is the same. You look at one direction and the other direction, every direction you look, the temperature of the, the cosmic microwave background, which has to do with how long ago in various different directions was the universe that dense, it's consistent to better than 1%. So we have this uniform glow everywhere, but if you look carefully enough, it's not perfectly uniform. There are, in fact, little fluctuations. So the fluctuations here are one, like one part in 40,000, something like that, um, are about where the fluctuations are on top of it. There's actually a bigger variation that has to do with the Doppler shift and the motion of the, our galaxy through the universe or our sun through the galaxy. But leaving that aside, there are a few little fluctuations in the cosmic microwave, but not a few, they're locked, they're all over the sky, but they're really, really tiny, one part in 40,000, but they're real and they're there. And it turns out by analyzing these fluctuations, you can learn all kinds of things, all sorts of things about our universe, various parameters of our cosmology. You can test um, things like, is our basic cosmology model working? Other things like what's the mass density of the universe? Uh, how does that compare to the overall density of the universe? There's lots of information you can, can get from this. And one of those pieces of information you can get is the Hubble constant. Now this sounds a little paradoxical because we are looking 13.7 billion years in the past and getting today's value of the Hubble constant from it. So how does that work? Well, basically, because what we're doing is we're taking our standard model of cosmology and applying it to this cosmic microwave background image and to get the right picture, what value of today's expansion do we need? And so that's a way that you can get the Hubble constant, just one of the parameters of cosmology by looking at the cosmic microwave background. So it's a different way of measuring the Hubble constant from looking at bright stars or looking at supernova and doing, and, and looking what I'm gonna call the current way, the, the local universe or the recent way of looking at the Hubble constant, where we're looking no more back in time than say a billion years, which while sounds like a long time to you, compared to 13.7 billion years for the whole universe, that's not really all that long. So if we look at nearby, quote unquote, nearby galaxies, um, up to say, you know, a billion light years away, something like that, um, that's the first way I told you about measuring the Hubble constant. If you look at the cosmic microwave background, you're looking back in time at 13.7 billion years, you get a different way of measuring the Hubble constant. So as recently as, 19, as 2004, just a few years ago, um, these measurements were still pretty much consistent with each other. So when I say the distance ladder, that's a technical term, but it has to do with looking at stars and supernova and things like that in nearby galaxies. This was our best estimate, 73 plus or minus 2.4. Um, so you can see that the error bar has gone down since that 2001 paper. From the cosmic microwave background, we had a more precise value. It was 69.6 plus or minus 0.7. The error bars don't exactly overlap, but they're very close. And so they, they were not different by more than two sigma. And that's not something you get excited about. There was a several percent chance that randomly we would get values different by that much. So we considered this basic consistency at least it was it, it was a minor inconsistency but not real so we saw you know we had an idea that we knew the value of the Hubble constant probably to about one percent uh, because we had this measurement that's good to one percent and it's consistent with this measurement that's good to about three percent and at least they were they were almost consistent and they you know to the 90 percent level they were consistent sort of thing so great we felt good about that um, that was the last time we felt good about the Hubble constant because over the next few years this happened. So what are you looking at here? Well, on the horizontal axis is year of publication. It only goes back to 2000. And here is the Hubble constant with values between 60 and 80. Now, here's the thing I want you to notice about this. Remember on an earlier slide, we had values that all the way from zero up to like 600. And between 1970 and 2000, it was uncertain between 50 and 100. So all the differences on that, you know, that would have been going from here up to off the top of my slide. So the differences we're talking about here are much smaller than the differences we used to be talking about before. This is that 2001 measurement that gave us 73 plus or minus eight. So that was our best measurement. Um, Cepheids is a kind of variable star, so that's one way of measuring it. TRGB stands for tip of the red giant branch. It's another way of looking at stars to try and get an estimate for the Hubble constant that's been used more recently. 
And then CMB stands for Cosmic Microwave Background. And our early CMB values of the Hubble constant, which came from the WMAP satellite, were 100% consistent, absolutely consistent with the values that we had before. And when you get to 2004, you know, you're here. In 2004, they're still barely overlapping. Right after that, we started getting lower error bar measurements of the Cosmic Microwave Background, the Planck satellite. Uh, started returning lower error bar measurements. And what's more, we were getting better and better measurements with these Cepheid variable stars, and the two diverged. Basically, they were consistent up to here, but then as the error bars shrank, they didn't come together. And so now, these two measurements are discrepant with each other at a statistically significant level. So we have two different ways of measuring the Hubble constant. One of them gives us here something like 68 or 67, kilometers per second per megaparsec. The other one gives us a value of like 72 or 73 kilometers per parsec or kilometers per second per megaparsec. Now, those are so close together that if you went back in time and told me in grad school we were uncertain about that, I would say, what are you complaining about? You have it way better than we have it. But the error bars are also extremely small. And so the precision of these estimates are such that even though they're really close compared to what we would have thought in the 1990s, they are not consistent with each other. There's this big difference between those two. And then here's this third measurement that, that some people started using recently, the tip of the red giant branch. And you notice it nicely comes in between. So, oh dear. So what's going on here? There are other ways of measuring the Hubble constant. And by and large, most of the ways, I mean, some of them have big old error bars. So they're, they're preliminary and we don't yet know what they're going to tell us. Um, but another, there are other ways of measuring it. Many of them, most of them where you look in the local universe, give a value more consistent with this value and inconsistent with the cosmic microwave background. So we have this problem that we have different ways of measuring the Hubble constant, the most fundamental parameter of our universe, and they're different. And so that tells us something is wrong. Something somewhere is wrong. You see headlines about this all the time. Usually the headlines include words like new physics or throw out our model of cosmology or things like that, which are a little hyperbolic in my view. This is a real outstanding problem, but that doesn't necessarily mean we have to throw out all our model of cosmology. So when I say our model of cosmology, what do we need? Well, really it's on a couple different levels. Our fundamental model, the big picture idea is just the Big Bang. And the Big Bang is just this idea that the universe a long time ago was in a very hot and dense state, and it has expanded and cooled off to today where we have stars and galaxies. That's the hugest overview of the Big Bang. The Big Bang's an interesting name for the theory because it's named after a moment that honest pictures include as a question mark because we don't actually understand. And in fact, we know that we don't understand because we know we don't have physics that works to even estimate what happened at quote unquote, the moment of bang if there was such a thing. So really we can only start estimating a short time after that, our tiny fraction of a second after that. But then we can do calculations, a lot of calculations that are consistent with a lot of different data um, from this tiny fraction of a second to today. So the Big Bang, as the idea that the universe was hot and dense, it started with a, a, a rapid expansion rate, it was hot and dense, and then as it, as it has expanded, it's gotten lower density and cooled off. Um, that's the basic picture of the Big Bang, and that's in no danger whatsoever. However, the Big Bang is a big, gigantic umbrella, and within the Big Bang, there's a lot of more detailed models and in fact we have a standard more detailed model that we call lambda cdm and so if you read news articles sometimes it will refer to lambda cdm what's important to realize is that lambda cdm is not synonymous with the big bang um, the big bang is a car lambda cdm is a volkswagen bug it's just one way you can do the big bang it's our standard model because you start with the Big Bang, but then there's all kinds of various parameters that aren't set there. Lambda CDM chooses what a bunch of those parameters are, and that, those choices seem to fit the data really well. And it has this name, well, that there's two pieces to the name. The first one is Lambda. Lambda was what Einstein originally called his cosmological constant. What it really means is that this mysterious dark energy, the stuff that we don't know what it is, but the it's making the universe's expansion accelerate. It's really bizarre. Well, in the Lambda CDM model, it's vacuum energy. What does that mean? That means get a region of space, take out everything that you can take out, take out all the atoms, take out all of the fundamental particles, take out all of the photons until you can't take anything else out. It's, there's still some residual energy density. 
that would be vacuum energy. And so if that residual energy density is not zero, but it's really small, well, that would, that would cause the universe's expansion to accelerate, and that's what dark energy would be. That's our default model. Now, there's lots, many other possibilities for what dark energy is. If dark energy is a cosmological constant, we will not have a big rip. Dark energy has to be different from vacuum energy to get a big rip. And so, the, so obviously, we're thinking about other kinds of dark energy. The other half of this is CDM. The other, you know, big mystery. Oh, wait, I thought the big mystery was the Hubble tension. Well, okay. Two of the big mysteries are what is dark energy and what is dark matter. CDM is a particular kind of dark matter called cold dark matter. And cold doesn't mean what you think it means. It doesn't mean that, you know, you can put ice cream in it and keep it cold. Um, you're, if you, uh, you know, the... the Air in your stove when you heat it up to 300, 450 Fahrenheit is cold in that none of the air molecules are moving close to the speed of light. So when a cosmologist refers to something as cold, they just mean the particles are not moving close to the speed of light. So the surface of the sun is cold in that way of talking about it. So cold dark matter just means the dark matter particles are big enough. They're still tiny fundamental particles, but they're big enough that with at the energies they have, they are not moving close to the speed of light. So detailed models of the growth of structure um, match cold dark matter very well. And so we believe cold dark matter is the right kind of dark matter. And lambda CDM together matches a whole bunch of stuff very well. But there is this problem that if lambda CDM is right, then the measurements of the Hubble constant from the cosmic microwave background and the local measurements of the Hubble constant should be consistent with each other, and they're not. And so this is what we say when we say our standard model is in trouble. It means that lambda CDM is in trouble, maybe, and I'll, I'll explain the maybe a little bit on the next slide. It doesn't mean the Big Bang is in trouble. It just means either dark matter isn't strictly CDM or dark energy isn't vacuum energy or both. And the differences may not even need to be all that big to explain the discrepancy in the Hubble constant. It just does mean, though, that it, it can't be exactly this. And of course, Sisigi has said a couple times now, or the observations that are in error. And so resolving the tension, that's my number one. Why do we have this tension? The observations are in error. Because of course, we've been down this road many times before. Um, I say unidentified systematics, Sisigi also mentioned, or the error bars are underestimated. The, hub, the history of the Hubble constant is a history of people underestimating their error bars. I think we do a lot better job about it now than people did back in the 70s and 80s, but it's conceivable that we still are not estimating our error bars right. Well, the statistical error bars, I'd be surprised if those weren't estimated right, but it could be there's additional systematic errors. What that means is, for example, looking at Cepheid variable stars, Cepheid variable stars um, are massive stars tend to be found in regions of galaxies that have lots of dust. Have we corrected for the dust correctly? Well, we think so, but maybe we haven't, for example. So it could be that there are systematic errors that we are not correcting for that would shift the estimate of the Hubble constant if we did correct them for. It could be in both methods, one or both methods. It could be that we have a systematic errors with our nearby measurements. It could be systematic errors in the um, Planck measurements. Uh, I don't know. And if I had to bet, I would bet that this is what it's going to turn out to be, that we will discover some small systematics and the measurements will become consistent with each other. That would be my bet, but of course that's just a bet. I don't have a real scientific reason for believing that. So we need to consider the other possibilities. And one is lambda CDM isn't quite right version one. Dark, dark energy is more complicated than vacuum energy. And of course, if it's a kind of dark energy that we call phantom dark energy, that would lead to a big rip. And so that's kind of awesome. We kind of want that because everything being torn apart and a huge, gigantic explosion that rips apart even atoms and molecules, who wouldn't want that, right? Right? Anyway, so it's possible that dark energy is not just vacuum energy. Um, now, the thing is, is the people who have tried to model this and explain the differences, it's kind of challenging, actually, to do it without making dark energy especially contrived. But OK, that's one possibility. Another is dark matter isn't strictly cold. And once again, it's the same thing. People who've tried to model it haven't been able to explain it um, with very sort of the simplest ways of modifying dark matter. But, you know, this is a possibility. There are other possibilities people think about. And it might be that we actually live in a slightly special region of space. And that's sort of heresy because the fundamental assumption of cosmology 
uh, the cosmological principle is that we are nowhere special, that we're not in a special place in the universe, but we're in a typical place in the universe. Well, what if it turns out that there's fluctuations in the overall density and we happen to be in a low density region that could explain some of the differences. And obviously something else I haven't mentioned, there's other things people are thinking about I haven't mentioned, and um, something, yeah, maybe gravity, general relativity is a little bit off is, a, is another possibility, but it's also possible it's something that nobody's thought of yet will explain the discrepancy. So we have right now the most basic parameter of our universe is the current expansion rate. It's parameterized by the Hubble constant, um, and we have two ways of measuring it by looking at two different epochs in the universe, way back when and now, and we get two values that are different by several percent, but the uncertainties are much smaller than that. So we know something is wrong. And so this is a giant outstanding question in cosmology right now that um, lots of people are working on one way or the other, lots of people are thinking about, and the implications of the answer to this question will resonate throughout all of cosmology. Maybe. If it turns out it's systematic errors, not so much. If it turns out it's not systematic errors, then that's going to affect what we think about dark energy, dark matter, maybe gravity, how the universe expands, and all that sort of thing. I would not say, though, that this discrepancy threatens the notion of the Big Bang at all. So when you read our in the newspapers about our whole our model of the universe has to be thrown out, they're not talking about the Big Bang. They're talking about Lambda CDM. So I will stop there and leave us some time if, in case anyone has any questions. Okay, uh, great, Rob, that was fantastic. Uh, really loved your slides. Really liked the use of color here on this last slide to highlight the different uh, bullet points. That's very nice. Um, so I don't know that I have any questions. If uh, anyone, uh, if any of our panelists have questions, uh, feel free to uh, speak up in voice. Uh, and any of our students have questions, feel free to Post them in nearby chat, and we'll try to address them. Um, all right. Lots of applause. Ariane has a question. If I'm an astronomer from Mars, what do I think about the future of the Earth? Um, well, I guess if I'm an astronomer from Mars, I'm jealous because Earth has such a thick atmosphere and is so warm. On the other hand, if I'm an astronomer from Mars, I probably really like thin atmosphere and cold. So I think the Earth is a nightmare <laughs> world like we think Venus is. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of an interesting question because would an astronomer from Mars think differently about global warming and climate change than the people here on Earth do? And of course, you know, on Earth, you listen to the people who actually do the science on climate change, and we know pretty well that we're in a lot of trouble. Um, it's sort of the, the wor world rulers are finding various ways to drag their feet on even admitting that it's real. Uh, so what would an astronomer from Mars think? Yeah, I, I think maybe they'd think, damn, I'm glad I don't live there. They're going to be in trouble in 100 years. Yeah, that's an interesting question. And uh, it reminds me of a, of a cartoon that was, uh, it might have been a far side cartoon, where you see um, a bunch of Martians, um, maybe they're astronomer Martians, and they're looking at the Earth and, and all these mushroom clouds are, 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 are enveloping the surface of the Earth in some large uh, conflagration. They're saying, ooh, ooh, great fireworks show. Hey, actually, right. I have a. I want to go back and ask Jean Pierre a question. Um, yes. I, I I think I might have remembered history wrong. Um, I had this idea that the Hindu mathematicians did not have zero, and it was the Arabs who introduced zero. Am I wrong about that? Yeah, I thought that too. Is uh is it uh, yeah, Nikolai? Uh, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. I'm kind of here. I'm just. I was. Volunteer, uh, 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 no mathematical zero. Uh, uh, it is an extremely interesting object. So the the, the, the zero was uh, mathematically uh, understood as a number equal to uh, natural numbers, 
besides one property you can divide by, by zero they uh, it was first introduced by uh, Indian math mathematicians uh, in century by uh, Indian astronomer actually Brahma uh, Gupta so uh, uh, and uh, then uh, it was a big story about it so it was also impressive intention uh, also for Indian uh, so uh, the intention that uh, it is some kind uh, naming of nothing so uh, it is uh, output of uh, typically Indian yoga and uh, during 500 years after it uh, there was a uh, discussions, uh, intensive discussions in Indian mathematics how to uh, make possible to divide by zero. So zero, mathematical zero is really uh, Indian intention and it was documented to carry that. Yeah. So Indian's contribution to mathematics was nothing. Uh, <laughs> Indian, uh, nothing uh, and other things. It is very impossible. It is a naming of nothing. The name for nothing which uh, make nothing equal to something. <laughs> yes. Sir. It is. A, it's kind of cool though that, uh, in some sense, their culture um, and uh, their religion sort of um, uh, maybe conditioned them or op made them open. To the concept of nothingness, and that and that it required a name, yes, and that sure. perhaps a, a West uh, and Western cultures um, were less open to that because their culture didn't really have a philosophical or or cultural basis to really appreciate the importance of nothing. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, you are completely right, and actually, um, uh, one of the origin of mathematics. Uh, not only counting, not only numbers, but uh, uh, theological uh, disputes. And so uh, the disputes about the naming of God, and uh, ah. actually there was a dispute about naming of nothing, and so on, and so on, and so on. They, uh, and uh, uh, actually, uh, if you look at uh, Mathematical genealogy, there is much as either in the internet, so uh, who learned from whom, then uh, uh, any roots goes through uh, theologists, and it is actually from uh, theological disputes uh, is pretty, pretty relative to this question and uh, the provide a great input in kind of um, mathematical reasoning now. Yeah, um, yeah <laughs> you know, I didn't expect to land at this place, but uh, after this discussion, but maybe we should all take another look at the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> yes, sure. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, actually, you know, actually you know, it's better to to Upanishads and so to uh, uh, Indian uh, various brand of Indian philosophy. Yaya logic, for example, <coughs> extremely interesting. And, uh, so kind of yoga of uh, his own. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah, I find it interesting um, that India. Um, it, I find that like there's a um, the idea of, of giving nothing to mathematics is is, is somewhat um, contradictory on the surface. Um, you see these surface contradictions that seem to be um, inherent in certain philosophy, like uh, or certain ways of, of thinking, like uh, meditation. Part of an Indian culture is meditation, and, and in order to clear your mind, you're supposed to allow yourself to think of things during meditation, and be conscious of what you're thinking of. And then you let them go, doing that repeatedly, breathing correctly. Yes, that's right. It's a, 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 a quieting the monkey mind in your head. Yes. Exactly. And so right. that's, that's, they embrace contradictions in their culture, and 
so they would see the value of nothing. Yes, sure, sure. Actually, uh, I'm spending sometimes, sometime uh, in, in the south of India, where all this development uh, of the Indian second Hadex uh, was gone. Uh, and so they, up to now, have absolutely unique uh, tradition of uh, teaching uh, mathematics so in homes in in small uh, colleges uh, near temples and they uh, uh, they are using some pedagogical, you know, pedagogical uh, techniques which is uh, unknown to us and so uh, they uh, really uh, can uh, uh, simple people that really can count and so uh, have some interesting view and understanding of mathematics yes, turn off your mind relax and float downstream <laughs> it is not dying <laughs> okay on that uh, off off key note, uh, I regret uh, we really should wrap it up here. Uh, we're at our time limit, I think. Uh, I want to thank our panelists who were fantastic today and uh, for our students for their enjoyable commentary and to Chan and Jess for organizing today's talk. And here I will gavel our panel discussion to a close. Thanks, thank everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming. Thanks to the organizers. Thanks to my other panel panel members. And to Matthew.